Hi, everybody. Welcome to our session. It's the first time I've done one of these in a movie theater. And uh, the seats look very comfortable, so try not to fall asleep. But if you do, there is a full recline mode, apparently, and one of the buttons there. So I see a couple have already taken advantage of this. OK, so we're going to be talking about building a global data presence with, Go with a big table. That's the, the title. And my name is Carter Page. I'm the engineering lead for Cloud Big Table at Google. And today joining us is going to be Subhashri Mandal, who is a principal engineer in the networking group, and Doug McCarlin, uh, who is an early architect of Cloud Big Table, and he will be our DJ during the demos. So, uh, so we're talking about moving communication, uh, moving data around the world, and moving data quickly, low latency access to data has always been an important and valuable thing to leaders and business and governments, et cetera. You go back to 40, 490 BC, you have Pheidippides running the distance from Marathon to Athens, and in his last dying breath, announces victory over the Persians. You fast forward just another 2,000 years, and you have victory over Napoleon at Waterloo. And the Rothschild family at this time had a famous communication network throughout Europe. Their families spread around the, the, uh, the continent and in England. And using horses and people and you know, maybe carrier pigeons at this point in time, they transmitted information of the, the defeat of Napoleon a full 48 hours before the prime minister's own messengers got word to them, allowing them to make a run on British, British bonds and increase their already massive fortune in a very famous case of information arbitrage. Just 200 years later, and now you're able to transmit entire copies of the Library of Congress around the world in just minutes. And it's a truly amazing accomplishment for mankind, if you think about it. Even just 20 years ago, if you wanted to do this, you'd be better served by throwing digital tapes in the back of a FedEx truck. So now you can move this data around really quickly. But the hard part is actually keeping actual data corpuses in sync on opposite sides of the planet. And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today. So we put out a blog post this morning. We announced that we actually went GA with the global replication for Cloud Big Table. And what this will allow you to do, and we'll go into more detail in a bit, is it'll allow you to replicate your data between any four regions around the world. So you can have them two regions, uh, two zones in one region, two zones in another region, or you could have one zone in each of four regions. So th this gives you uh, data look, uh, actually let me go back to this for a second. So this, uh, th in addition to the immediate access, so one of the things I want to point out is this basically gives you low latency access for each of the different uh, data points. So this uh, means a smoother experience for your customers. Imagine you have your customers in one, one country or one continent, and maybe you have call centers on the other side of the world. If they both have low latency access to the same data, it's going to be a better experience. There's going to be less la lag time when people are calling on the phone. There's a bunch of other applications we'll get into as well. Another value here is unified analysis. Imagine you're collecting data from a bunch of different sites or users around the world. If you don't replicate into a single place, then you have to run ETL jobs or some, something to pull it in. This just gets your data within minutes, usually in, within seconds of fact, to a single place. And you can run your analytics workloads in that, in that location. Pick one of your zones to, to do for that type of workload. And the last thing you can do is you, can, you basically get an out-of-the-box out of disaster recovery solution. So you, pit, you spin up another zone that just sits there to be, be ready in case you have a problem. And we can either automatically fail over, or you can fail over manually yourself. And then you get data localization. You specify exactly where you want the data to live. And this is obviously important for finance and other sorts of industries that have strict jurisdictional re uh, restrictions in terms of where the data sits. So today, I'm going to talk about what Cloud Big Table is and get into the details of the global replication and how you can use it. Then Subhashri is going to come up and talk about our global cloud network, uh, the fiber that spans the, spans the globe. You probably heard about this a little bit in our keynotes. She's also going to get into the software that helps to make it work. And then Doug is going to give us a demonstration of just to show how easy it is to actually set up a global data presence uh, on the stage. So. Um, and just so we're not, we're not uh, cheating by using like a small amount of data, we're going to start with 10 terabytes, 12, sorry, 12 terabytes. And uh, it takes, it's not instantaneous, it does take some minutes to start copying. So we're going to start with Doug and get that copy set up, and then we'll, we'll come back to it later in the presentation. So. 
Hey, so uh, I'm Doug. I'm one of the engineers on the Cloud Big Table team, and I'm one of the developers of the replication feature. And right, Carter just painted a pretty cool picture, right? Um, you can put your data anywhere. We'll keep it in sync for you. You don't have to do anything uh, except click a couple buttons. Uh, I'm sure some of you are wondering how true that really is, right? What are the asterisks on this announcement? Uh, do you have to change your apps that are running to uh, be safe with replication? Do you need to stop your traffic while you're setting it up? Do you need to lock in your topology first and then copy data into it yourself? Um, and can you really put data anywhere you want? Or are there restrictions there? Um, and it turns out the answer to all these questions is no. Uh, you, really, or, uh, <laughs> you don't have any of these asterisks. Uh, we will take care of all of these things for you. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully show you how easy this is uh, live on stage. This is a terrifying demo to give. Um, but so, like Carter mentioned, we've got 12T sitting in Oregon right now. Uh, and I am going to click a couple buttons, and we're going to copy it, if we want to go to the next slide, to South Carolina, Finland, and Taiwan. And uh, with any luck, it's going to be done by the time I come back up in 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, so in order to get this started, we're just going to go over to, can we get the uh, demo up? We go over to the Edit Instance page. And I want to emphasize this is the Edit Instance page, not the Create Instance page. Right? You're able to change this whenever you want. Um, and all you have to do is add clusters to your instance. Every cluster is a set of nodes in a zone. And every cluster in your instance serves every table. Uh, and if you change your mind later, deletes are also safe. We'll hold that data uh, behind the scenes for you until it's safely copied out. So I'm just going to add a couple clusters here. Right? First, US East 1. That's South Carolina. And then we're going to add uh, Europe North 1, which is Finland. And then we're going to add Asia East 1, which is Taiwan. And then I'm just going to hit Save. And now we're done, right? I can leave. Um, so this is going to spin for a couple seconds, then we're going to show you what's actually going on. So we're back on the instance overview. And we see already we've got four clusters here. Uh, we've got some spinners over here. A couple of them are already finished. That's for provisioning nodes. And what this means is as soon as this spinner is done, you can create a new table and start using it right away. Right? These clusters are happy to do that for you. Over on the right, uh, we see some other spinners. Those are for your existing tables, which have started copying over. And that's what I'm going to come back up and show, hopefully finished in a little bit. Uh, but we can see some of the progress there by going over to the tables list page. Right? So this says we've got the one table with all this data, and it's copying. And you can expand this to show its state in each cluster. It's copying in all of them right now. These are going to turn into progress bars. There's one right now. It's at 1%. Uh, all of these are eventually going to start going. And hopefully, they should all be green later on. Um, but another thing that I mentioned right is, do you have to stop your traffic while this is going on? Is it unsafe to keep writing? And the answer is no. Uh, and to show that, I've actually got a loop running already, uh, which is writing victory into row Athens in this table. And you can see that here. Right? All of this is going to the original cluster. And even as these new clusters come online, uh, if we go back to the slide, right, we've got uh, and can we go to the next one? We've got default routing. right? This comes out of the box. You don't have to do anything. If you don't tell us what to do, we are going to keep your traffic flowing as it always has to the original cluster in your instance. Um, and this is so that you don't have to make any changes to set this up. Right? All your existing apps keep working. And these new copies are essentially backups until you tell us otherwise. So all these writes are going uh, into the original cluster. and. Just to show there's nothing at my sleeve, I'm going to show you the command that I ran. Right, this is a simple uh, loop over the CBT command line. It's, got, uh, it's doing a set for a demo table. Row Athens, uh, the demo column family, equals victory. So I'm going to start running that again. And that's going to go the whole time. And then when I come back, we're going to count how many times this wrote into the original cluster. And we're going to count how many times it wrote into one of the new copies. And they should be the same because we're keeping the data in sync. And so with that, I'm going to hand things back to Carter. Hello. All right. Thanks, Doug. 
Um, okay, so we got that kicked off. We'll come back later and do some fun things with this new global cluster, uh, global instance we have set up. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is Cloud Big Table and how does it work and what do you actually use it for. So, uh, so first, let me get into the replication thing that we're talking about here. So a year ago, we announced regional replication, which allowed you to put multiple clusters into a single region. So you could have it used to be a zonal service, and now you could have two zones, two clusters running in separate zones in a single region. And this gave you a few benefits. It gave you an extra nine on your SLA by expanding your failure domains. It allowed users to isolate served analytics workloads. And some presenters have actually talked about how they do that. Uh, Spotify does this a bit, where you can say, have one cluster that is serving low latency traffic to your customers, and you have another cluster that you're pounding with a MapReduce or, or a data flow job and just beating it up, essentially. You can have isolation so they're not interfering with each other. Uh, to that point, you can also independently scale the cluster. So you could scale up your batch cluster uh, to make that go faster while that's happening and you know, keep, your, keep your serve cluster at a different level. And it also provides, if you're using the, the application profile that supports this, then you, could, then you would get automatic failover. So if one zone failed, all of your traffic would automatically go to the other zone. So today we're announcing is the GAF global replication. And there's two main changes with this. This allows you, one, you get to replicate between four zones, not two. And it completely removes the restriction in what region those zones are in. So as I mentioned before, you could put, you know, you could put one on the East Coast or the West Coast. You could put two. Uh, you, know, you could have a uh, Japanese cluster. You have one in Osaka, one in Tokyo. And then you can also fan these out around the globe. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, why you might use some of these different things. All right, so Bigtable itself. There's main reasons to use Bigtable is speed and low latency. So it's a very high throughput system. Uh, and these, this throughput is nice and linearly scalable. We did a presentation a couple of years ago, in fact, with, uh, where we demonstrated that uh, Bigtable could handle, if you, we threw 3,000 nodes up and were able to get 30 million QPS durable writes and 30 gigabytes per second. Uh, and that was that was far from the peak of what we could actually pull off on on the system. Um, the other thing that you get while uh, this is kind of a remarkable thing is there's other ways you can do very high speed ingestion. But the trick about Bigtable is while you're blasting this data in, uh, the split second or a split nanosecond after we acknowledge you're right, uh, it is immediately accessible for reads, and it's it, the read latency is very low, so single digit mill, millisecond latency. So if you're using flash, maybe three to four milliseconds, HDD, maybe a couple of milliseconds more. And then, but generally the long tail itself stays within about 10 milliseconds. And that's a, that's a nice set of characteristics. And then with this, you get a very linear scalability. So the knob you use on Bigtable, kind of the only knob we give you for, for configuration is nodes. So you start with three as your basic production cluster. And then you can scale it up from three to 10 to 300. And as mentioned, we've gone as high as 3,000 before. And the thing that's kind of nifty about Bigtable is the scale, the, the scalability curve is actually linear, uh, well beyond you know from 30 at least to the 30 million point, and that's pretty nifty because usually these these curves start to flatten out a little bit over time. Um, the internally we've optimized the bottlenecks enough where it goes linear you know, way beyond these bounds essentially. And this is valuable for planning uh, in terms of thinking about how many nodes you're going to need for different load. You don't have to test it out. You can, once you get certain sample loads that are representative, you know, get a good sense of what, what size cluster you would need to handle, say, 10x that, 100x that. It's also good for business purposes because if your business is attached to the amount of operations that you're having on your big table, then you can predict cost of revenue, and that's useful. So part of the way that Bigtable does this is it abstracts out the storage from the actual processing layer. So your Bigtable nodes are essentially they're kind of quasi-stateless things that sit on top of the actual storage system, which is a file system called Colossus, which is a newer generation system that replaced our earlier Google file system. And the nodes are responsible for making sure that the data is there to be read quickly, so it's holding on to the indexes in memory. And it's also channeling your data through to make sure you're getting that really nice write throughput. But by keeping them separate, you can do some cool things, like we can do really aggressive rebalancing, which we do. 
So imagine the A over there uh, represents a, uh, a, a single chunk of data. Um, and this chunk of data is getting a lot of activity. Maybe it's a pattern that crops up every day at 2.30 in the afternoon. And what Bigtable will do is we'll say, okay, so A is getting hot, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start moving things off of this node so this node can serve more of the A traffic, essentially. And Bigtable does this fairly quickly. It checks these patterns every couple of minutes or so and just keeps rebalancing. It does this all day, every day. So even as patterns go change throughout the day, Bigtable will, will come back and keep readjusting the same patterns as it sees them you know, day in, day out. Another advantage is you get very, uh, very easy resizing, very fast resizing. So if you're familiar with other systems like uh, Cassandra and things like that, where you have to deal with re-indexing, resizing is kind of a pain on a lot of these, those systems. Here you can just throw nodes at it. Uh, the, the nodes will be available in seconds. It'll take several minutes for us to rebalance to get the maximum kind of bin packing of your, your load onto these nodes. Um, and then, you know, you can do some cool things with this. So one is, uh, one, it's good for operational issues. Surprise traffic, just throw some nodes at it. Another could be, at the end of the week, maybe you have a large batch process, which takes 10 hours, and you wish it would take one hour. So you just, you know, up your cluster by 10x, run your batch load, and then spin it back down again. Okay, so here's a few different use cases. So one is ad tech. So, um, Google is, uh, has a little bit of ad tech in, in, inside our company, and we do a lot of this stuff on top of Bigtable. Um, it's a low latency system, which is nice, and what you can do is you can use global replication to put your data where your users are. So Bigtable's already low latency, as I mentioned, but then if you can actually put your data clo even closer to your customers, then that can shave off milliseconds of, of, of network traffic. So in this example, we have a zone set up on the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Central US. Another example is financial services, and this gets to the disaster recovery situation I was talking about. You could set up a couple of zones to be your primary high availability service uh, pretty close to Wall Street. You're not going to do high frequency trading on this, but it's good enough for back office operations and things like that. It's still going to be very fast and very high throughput. And then we've got a South Carolina zone that's about 400 miles to the south. And so you could set that up, uh, and we will just be replicating your data there. If you have a problem, you know, if North Virginia goes down, if there's a hurricane or whatever, um, then we will automatically fill over to South Carolina, or if you prefer, we can have a manual fill over to South Carolina. And your recovery point objective is going to be measured in minutes, uh, in, in the worst case. That would be the long tail of the replication latency. Most of your data will be there in just seconds. And your rep replication time objective, if you're doing automated failover, automatic filler, can be measured in seconds. Uh, the third case I mentioned, and the third, ca third case I go into detail on, is IoT. So we have a lot of customers who use us for telemetry storage. There's actually a lot of industrial IoT cases. There's a, there's a uh, cool company called Cognite, which uses us for uh, oil platforms and shipping. Go, you know, go check them out on the um, on the the expo floor. It's pretty neat. Um, in this case, I'm going to give an example of commercial IoT, where imagine you have a mobile phone app, maybe that collects data on exercise habits, and you want to have a conversation essentially with your customer. You're getting telemetry data from the customer. You want to process that data, give them advice back. If you just have your data in the US, then you're going to have a poor experience for everybody else. In this case, you could throw one cluster in each of your four different, uh, in four different continents and be close to customers all around the world, essentially. Low latency everywhere. Um, and then you could have your data, um, you could do your analytics in a single place. So imagine you make your Iowa cluster a little bit bigger, and that's getting all the data from all the other four continents, and then you're running maybe longer daily batch processing on, on that data as well. So other use cases for Cloud Big Table, um, we have gaming customers. Again, the low latency is uh, there is nice getting a being able to get a lot of data from a lot of users, that high write throughput is useful. It's a big data system, so genome sequencing uh, is another use case for Bigtable. And then energy utilities and telecom all have variations of things that work well for Bigtable. Geospatial data, again, things that often look like the IoT use cases I was, looking, uh, I was talking about before as well. But to make all this work, you have the software that is called Bigtable, but 
you know, we're kind of glossing over the fact that the data has to actually move between these different places, and that's actually really the hard part. Uh, so, and you need to make this network work. It has to scale. It has to handle an immense amount of traffic. We're moving, you know, uh, 10 terabytes here. We can move a lot more than that, actually. Um, and it needs to be cost efficient. Your business needs to be able to uh, afford it, and it needs to be available all the time. So to make this work, we have a we have a special network, and Sabashri is going to talk about the network and the software that makes this possible. So Sabashri. Thank you, Carter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Shubhashri, and I'm going to talk about the network that supports this uh, kind of applications. So at Google, we believe network is a key differentiator when it comes to building an application that's scalable and available. So Google has been investing quite a bit in this technology. For over a decade, the network infrastructure team in Google have been building a unique network infrastructure especially driven by Google's needs. Google's compute and storage infrastructure needed something that didn't exist in the industry. So we built uh, unique and innovative uh, products, and many of them have been published as research papers, and they have influenced the industry, the academia. But most importantly, they have served Google's applications, the essential applications that have over a billion users, like search, Gmail, YouTube. And going forward, the same infrastructure is going to be available for our Google, our cloud customers who can build their products on that. So this is a snapshot of Google Cloud Network. Um, the locations here are cloud regions, current and future ones. And not all of them are cloud big table regions yet. The footprints keep growing. And uh, I would like us to focus on the uh, dense graph that connects these locations. There are plenty of uh, terrestrial links, as well as a lot of transoceanic links. And these transoceanic links are quite interesting. We will talk about those a little more in details. Uh, some of these transoceanic links Google actually have invested in. For example, you can see there is one from uh, Florida to uh, Brazil. It's called Mone Cable System. That's operated by Google along with a few other telecom companies. We'll talk more about those. So talking about the density of the graph, that reflects the scale and availability of the network. Um, so the application, like the one we are going to demonstrate, is not running on public internet. It's running on a private global backbone that's run by Google. So every packet traverses a router that's controlled by Google. And one of the catastrophic failures in a normal network is fiber cut that causes partition and that causes system inconsistencies, etc., are quite rare in this kind of scenario. So many of these regions are actually hosted in our massive data centers. And each data center, by rule, has at least three different fibers that connects it to the uh, global network, which means fiber cut, which is often treated as a catastrophic failure, is not a catastrophic failure in this case. And yet another example is the transatlantic connectivity. As you can see, there are six different fiber routes that connect our North American regions to our European regions. What does that mean? That definitely talks about scale. Each of these fibers can carry several terabits per second of traffic, and there are six of them. And we expect them to fail independently, which means we can provide stricter bandwidth guarantee over these links across the ocean. And next, I'm going to show you a little bit of the behind the scenes story, how this is built. So this is a cartoon view of one of those six transatlantic cables uh, that connects uh, Virginia to London. And this is, of course, not drawn to scale. I have a sample cable for you to see. You can come and take a look after the presentation. So it's probably not as thick as you would imagine. I can wrap my fingers easily around it. And at the center of this cable, there is 
the optical fiber that carries the signal as pulses of light. I also have a spool of 25 kilometers of fiber. Take a look at it if you want later. So each of these fibers, it's made, made of glass, very high quality glass with no impurities whatsoever. And uh, each of these fiber strand, it's approximately as thick as a strand of hair, but it can carry 100 terabits per second of data. What does that mean? <laughs> 100 terabits per second would translate to something like 10 million streaming YouTube videos. And as you can see, the thickness of the cable gets thicker, gets wider near the shore because it's uh, high risk for damage. And these are laid out using ships. You can see a cartoon version of that. Sometimes there are two ships coming from two ends. And in the middle of the ocean, the cable is lifted off the ocean floor and spliced and bedded back into the ocean bed. We'll see a video soon. And we lay out these paths. We survey the path earlier so that we avoid rough terrains and uh, coral reefs, hungry sharks. So we'll see them in a bit. So water is not the first thing that will come to mind when we talk about networking. However, this is where a large chunk of our network lives. Not in the data centers. Data centers do have a piece, though. And uh, even though we don't think about water, but two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered with water, which means we cannot build a network around the globe without laying cables under these water bodies. My network is slow. <laughs> but people have been laying out these cables for a long time, for over 150 years. And these were not for this kind of data network, it was for telegraphy. What has changed more recently is what goes inside these cables. So we'll see in a bit how these cables are constructed and how they are laid out, especially with the example of Monet cable system. So in the center of the cable, we have the glass fiber. These are typically color-coded. Why? If we want to repair, we want to splice blue with blue and red with red. These are used for identification. And these are typically allocated pairwise, one in each direction, transmit and receive. And of course, there are a lot of protective layers. There is one layer that is very special. That's the copper layer. Because it's not just for protection, it's used for carrying power to the repeaters that sit along the path. And after, with all these letter, uh, layers, it's now ready to be buried under the seafloor. And if any of you happen to visit the Sunnyvale office, we have a model of one of these boats. Feel free to check it out. What about them? Maybe we trained them. <laughs> Uh, actually, to speak the truth, the sharks do bite these cables once in a while, but uh, with all the protective layers, they do not really damage the cables or cause an outage, so we cannot really blame them. Now back to how this network is used. So one key observation is that uh, there is a lot more traffic between servers than a server and an user. And the inter-server traffic is not only high in volume, it also has a very different characteristics. It's more bursty, there's no smooth diurnal pattern, and more amenable to classification. There's so much of this traffic that we built a whole separate backbone, we call it B4. That's our backend backbone and that connects our data centers. And uh, people say developers at Google get to use wide area network, just like people get to use local area network in other places, thanks to before. But this privilege should not be limited just to Google developers. With cloud offerings, like Cloud Big Table, this network would be available to our, users, our cloud users as well. So what does it take to build a network like this? 
Scale is, of course, a very challenging goal, and everything at Google has to be built at scale. And in presence of scale, other goals also become challenging. One thing to note here is that uh, as our compute scales, network scales quadratically because of its source dist pairwise nature, which means unit cost does not necessarily go down, unlike compute or storage. Uh, and availability, of course, is, a, is our final goal. Without availability, the uh, bandwidth makes no sense. So I'll talk about two approaches that we take to build a network like this. One is a hardware approach, and one is a software approach. So in terms of hardware, we do not use a lot of expensive feature-rich feature -rich routers. We use cheap commodity hardware, we mesh them, and build big switches. So SuperGate is our regional network that we use in most of our data centers uh, to connect zones within the region and peer with other regions. And it delivers 1.6 petabits per second of non-blocking capacity. And 1.6 petabits per second would translate to a few hundred million streaming videos. And that's all within a region. And this picture shows one of the eight building blocks of SuperGate. It's built with a few hundred cheap commodity switches meshed to provide 2,000 ports, each with 100 gig capacity. So this is the hardware piece of the solution. And on the software side, we follow a philosophy called software-defined networking technology. The main idea is to take the smarts out of the network and run them in servers that are available. In traditional network, routing and control software typically runs on the CPU that lives inside the routers, which is limited. So for us, these get to run on Google servers, powerful Google servers, and we get to leverage all of Google's distributed computing infrastructure. As a result, we can run uh, advanced optimization algorithms pretty fast and utilize all the links that have been deployed optimally. That means our network is more efficient. And also because of the good compute infrastructure, the algorithms converge faster, which means if there is a fiber cut, the network converges fast. So that produces high availability. It's much faster compared to traditional MPLS RSVP style networks. So with all these, what have we achieved? So the graph on the left shows how the scale of our network has grown in recent five-year period. The traffic has grown by two orders of magnitude. And at the same time, actually the last year of that period, we have measured availability and it has gone up by at least one nine. One nine actually translates to 10x improvement in unavailability. So uh, an hierarchical control system based on software-defined networking allowed us to do this. With that, I'm going to wrap up. We are not done yet. The network continues to evolve because Google believes network is a key differentiator and we have to continue to evolve and invest in it. We are not only delivering new features as needed by our customers, which is Google applications and cloud applications. We are growing in scale. We continue to innovate, upgrade in place and we continue to improve scale, availability, and decrease cost. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Carter. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Abashi. 1.6 petabits per second is pretty bonkers, isn't it? All right. Um, so we learned about how the software-defined network and all this fiber that we own uh, or, you know, or share, some of what we own, some of what we share, allows us to have the, the scale, the cost effectiveness, and the availability to provide the data locality around the world for a solution like Bigtable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to Doug. All right, I'm, we're going to pray to the demo gods, and let's see, if, uh, see how we're doing. So I'm smiling. The last one finished 10 seconds ago. <laughs> The other two have been done for a bit. Um, so just to remind what we were doing, right? We are running writes. Um, yeah, there we go. We're running writes through default routing. Um, 
We're writing Victory into Athens, and that's going to uh, the original cluster in Oregon. And we have replication set up now uh, between these four regions around the world. So if we cut back to the um, there. So you can see these are all done. We're waiting on a local uh, pass to collect disk usage on this one because it just finished. But um, everything is all set up. Replication is running. So um, next thing we're going to do, I'm just going to throw over to the monitoring page to show that we've been writing the whole time. And then we're going to kill these writes. Right, they've served their purpose. And uh, we're going to see how many times this write happened in the original cluster so we can sort of check for consistency here. So I'm um, going to run this command here. Uh, this is, again, the CBT command line tool. It's pointed at this table. It's doing a lookup now uh, into demo table for row Athens. I'm going to grep for victory, and I'm going to count the lines that come back. And we've got 3,115. So now what we want to do is see if that's the number somewhere else. But like I said, this default routing, if we don't tell where to send the request, it's going to go to this original cluster. So we need to set some routing rules up. To do that, I'm going to go over here into the, app the application profiles page. Uh, this is a cool feature I'm going to talk a little bit more in a second. But just to keep things going, we're going to create one of these. These let you uh, control your routing at a fine-grained level. And so I'm going to create one called check copy, give a little description. And I'll point this at, say, the Asia cluster. So this is C4. Um, and I'll create it. And all this is is an ID that you've set up with the server. And then when you send this ID with a request, we will route things as you set up for that ID. So we've created the new profile. Here you can see the old one, the default. And that's routed at C1, which is the original thing. Um, and now we just run this command again. All we have to do is add at profile equals check copy. Run it again, and we should get 3115 again. And there it is. So even though we were writing before, during, and after these copies, right, replication has kept this data in sync. It took probably only about two seconds for this to come across, um, which is sort of the typical 99th percentile number uh, that we generally see for these sorts of setups, especially since there's not a lot of traffic here to begin with. Um, so replication did the heavy lifting. I just want to talk about app profiles for a little bit, and then I'll show a monitoring graph. just takes a little while to load that shows that this actually routed where we said it did. Um, so app profiles, like I said, are an ID that you set up in advance. And I want to plug these to people who are looking into replication. I also want to plug these for people who are just using Bigtable and not ready for replication yet. Right? All an app profile is is a way to slice your traffic. We provide some config on the server side to let you control routing. But even if you don't need that, uh, it still gives you um, per application monitoring. So you can see, for example, how much traffic is coming from your batch job versus your streaming ingestion versus your uh, you know, live traffic serving reads. Um, and you know, that's a useful feature on its own. In addition, if you set up uh, one of these per app, if you do want to adopt replication, it gives you a fine-grained way to just move over one app at a time when it's ready for replication. And everything else will just do what it was doing before. Um, and the best part about that is you can just reroute it from here. You don't have to down your app or uh, change any code. right? You just change the server-side config, and we'll reroute everything for you. So um, hopefully I've convinced you, and hopefully I've also talked long enough for this to finish loading. So if we just go over to um, monitoring again, All right, so we see one read here. Looks like we did not quite have enough time to see the other read come in. So I'll return to this later. Um, I want to jump over to another instance now and show you some disaster recovery. Uh, this is something that Carter alluded to before. Right? And this is something that replication makes very easy. Um, so if we can go over to the slides, um, just show a nice diagram of what we're going to do. We'll go a couple forward. So the new setup that we have in this instance is we've got a primary serving cluster in Iowa, US Central, and we've got a backup cluster in Oregon. And we've also got a load generator running in Iowa, and it's using failover or any cluster routing. This goes nearest first. So whichever cluster is close, 
that's what we're going to use, and we will only try the other one if, it's, if the first request is slow or errors out for some reason. Um, and so you can see here, the traffic by default is all going to go right back into Iowa where it started. Uh, so if we cut back to the demo, you can see that that's exactly what's happening. We've got these two clusters, and um, right there you see that all that 20,000 writes per second, they're all going to the serve cluster, and none of them are going to the backup right now. Another thing that I want to point out is that the backup is smaller. Right? The backup's not taking any live traffic, uh, and the replication load that we're sending to it is a little bit more efficient because we can kind of batch and window things behind the scenes. So even though it has one-third the compute power of the serve uh, cluster, it's still able to keep up, which is all it has to do. It's just trying to keep this hot, swap, uh, hot swappable copy of the data alive. Um, so from there, we're going to go back to the edit instance page, and we're going to simulate what happens if that serve cluster goes down. Right? Uh, imagine there's a lot of fiber cuts, or there's a tornado, you know, a, a, a big outage in the zone. Uh, that makes most or all of your requests start failing. Uh, I'm going to simulate this by just deleting the serve cluster. Uh, and this is something that I encourage people to try themselves if they're using replication for this purpose, because it lets you sort of get a feel for what you need to do uh, in the event of uh, a failover situation. So you can see already, I don't know uh, if anybody was looking at the CPU before, the CPU is already going up in the backup cluster. This is going to update in a little bit, the writes per second. But um, behind the scenes, what's happening is everything is rerouting. It only takes a few seconds for this to happen. Uh, it takes longer, unfortunately, for the metrics to actually show up on the screen. Um, but so imagine this did happen. Right? Let's actually let's just go back to the slide so we can get a nice picture of this. Um, go to the next one. Right? This is going to route everything to Oregon now. If this actually happens, uh, there are a few things going on, right? In this case, the cluster is gone. But if the cluster were still there and throwing errors, every request is going to take a little bit of time to realize something's up and fail over. So that's going to add a little bit of latency. And the fact that it has to go further is also going to add a little bit of latency. But uh, the requests are still going to get served eventually. So this is a graceful degradation situation. Um, the couple things that you want to deal with here, number one, you might want to sort of cut out that failover latency. So in the real world, the other cluster is still there. It's throwing errors. You'd want to try to delete it. If the zone is really completely inaccessible, you might not be able to. But it's a good practice to try that out first. And then the next thing that you're going to want to do is size up the backup cluster. Carter mentioned this is very easy to do. Right? All you have to do, again, is click a couple buttons. And this is because we provisioned it lower for cost-saving purposes, but now it's actually taking the full traffic. and so. We're going to want to make it bigger so that it can handle the throughput without falling behind. Requests will be served a little slower, but they won't knock the cluster over. Right? And that's already done. And in the next few minutes, we're going to start rebalancing the load. And you're going to see the CPU utilization go down. Um, now hopefully, again, those graphs take a little while to load, but hopefully we can see already the initial failover from this going on. Yeah, so right here, you can see traffic uh, falling off a cliff to the serve cluster and traffic coming up to the uh, backup cluster. It's not quite all the way to where it was, and that's a consequence of that extra latency. Um, but the failover is working. And so once you've sort of handled the immediate emergency, things are still in a degraded state. We're going to do what we did in the other demo, and we're just going to add another cluster to set up replication someplace else that's working. So we can add a cluster, uh, say, if it's just a zonal outage, the original one was in US Central 1B. We can add a cluster in US Central 1C. And it will be copied in the time that it takes to come up and talk about networking. And that'll spin for a bit, and then it'll be done. So that's failover. Um, I just want to check back over here and see if I, yep. So this is the original demo, just showing that that second read request went to the other cluster. Um, and that's it. I'm going to hand things back to Carter. All right. Thanks, Doug. Let's go back to the slides here. So just to wrap up, you get um, with the failover solution, we saw that we were able to get fast global access to a single data set. We copied terabytes of data in just minutes. We do basically heavily paralyzed writes 
over this massive fiber network. So we're actually able to copy a lot of data uh, in a short amount of time. And it's so fast, as you, as you notice, like one of the things we're talking about is, hey, we need, we need an extra cluster in our instance. Let's just spin up another one on the other, si other side of the continent and just copy the data there. Um, and that, that's actually something that works pretty well. Uh, you get disaster recovery out of the box. Um, scaling up, scaling down takes seconds. Uh, and you can re reroute individual applications. You can use, you can use application profiles, configure each different application, use a different profile, even if they're all using the same routing rules. That gives you a lot of flexibility operationally to decide what you want to do with that traffic. So in summary, with global data replication, you get a global presence. So you basically a, a global local presence, essentially. You get the, the low latency of being local, but that data is kept in sync around the entire world in seconds, typically, and on minutes in the long tail. You have single digit millisecond latency, as I mentioned. It's a very high scale system. Um, we haven't found anyone who can push it beyond its limits yet. Um, if you think you can, let us, uh, let, we want to talk to you. And you have an out of the box disaster recovery solution with this as well.